Greetings, and welcome back to the channel. And today I'll take a look at the science fiction films of 1930. One remake, one partially lost serial, and a science fiction comedy musical. Suffice it to say, this was not a particularly memorable year for science fiction cinema. In 1930, the culture was a mix of difficulties and creativity. The Great Depression made life tough for many, and the exciting times of the Jazz Age were slowing down. Despite these challenges, people found ways to express themselves through art and literature. In movies, the introduction of sound a few years prior changed how stories were told. Certain genres dominated the decade, from screwball comedies, romantic dramas, and the rise of adventure, horror, and gangster films. However, outside the theater, there was a feeling of uncertainty as the world faced economic and political struggles, laying the groundwork for the years to come. By the end of the decade, the world would be at war once again. The failures of the First World War would give rise to the second. Before we dive into the films of 1930, if you're enjoying the content, please consider giving it a thumbs up. And if you haven't already, hit subscribe for your regular dose of sci-fi history. And just a reminder that the sci-fi films discussed today are available for free on YouTube, unless otherwise noted in their respective chapter. If that's ever the case, I'll post a link in the description of the video. Here we are, the third film adaptation of El Rani that I've discussed for this channel. The film, based on Hans Heinz Ewer's novel of the German myth, was the second to star Bridget Helm, best known for her role as Maria in Metropolis. This talkie is drastically different than the silent version from 1928, and the reviewers of the time called this one a more faithful adaptation of the original book. Directed by Richard Oswald, this German language talkie was described at the time as a science fiction and horror film that explores the ethical implications of artificial insemination. The story revolves around Albert Basserman, playing the character of a professor and scientist who conducts an experiment using the sperm of a hanged murderer and impregnates a prostitute. As Ovrani, played by Bridget Helm, grows older, it becomes evident that she has inherited some of the criminal tendencies of her biological father. The film wanted to delve into the themes of morality, science, sexual natures of women, and human nature at large that have been popular themes since early sci-fi cinema. Though described at the time as a mix of sci-fi and horror, I saw it as neither. Like the 1928 version, once you remove the initial concept of artificial insemination, the science fiction elements are completely absent. I could only find a German language version of the film, and my German is unfortunately spotty at best. So I'm glad I just watched the 1928 silent version and knew the basic conceits of the story. Once again, Bridget Helm shines on screen. She portrays not only Alrani, but also a bar girl named Alma in the beginning of the film. This was my first time hearing Helm's voice and wish she would have become a bigger star outside Germany so we could enjoy more of her amazing talent. But the film does little more than show off its star. It could have been an interesting story with deep themes, but none of the versions of the film that I've seen get into those themes more than just at a surface level. Reviews of the time were mixed at best. The New York Times called it a, quote, highly interesting production and praised both Helm and Basserman. The Times also called Richard Oswald's job as a director as, quote, the direction is competent. And Variety called the film, quote, very low level and involves ghastly ideas by Hans Heinz Yours. The picture is bad and silly, unquote. Variety's critic at the time disagreed with the New York Times about Oswald's directing, calling it, 
quote, so inferior in his direction that good actors are wasted, unquote. And I have to completely agree with this assessment. I was hoping this film would be edgier, but maybe I'm just a 21st century woman looking back at a 94-year-old film. You would think that casting the same leading lady in two versions of the same story would mean that the two films were connected, such as when 1929's High Treason was filmed as a silent film and then turned into a talkie. But alas, they are drastically different end results and have nothing to do with one another. There was really no reason to cast Helm in this film other than for a German production company to take advantage of her star power after Metropolis. I wish they would have delved more into the science fiction or horror elements that were advertised, but in the end, it's just another early sound melodrama. The Voice from the Sky is a 10-episode American serial directed by Ben F. Wilson and written by Robert Dillon. It's known as the first serial to be a true talkie. Receiving only a limited release at the time, the serial quickly faded away. Once believed to be lost, some of the reels were recovered in 2015, though I could only find a YouTube recreated version of the first episode with voice actors from the Serial Squadron YouTube channel. And their online archive of early film serials. I'll link their website in the description. They are a great resource for film serials and multiple genres. Starring Wally Wales and Neva Gerber, the story, according to the Serial Squadron website, summarizes it as, quote, a crazed scientist calling himself the voice from the sky, broadcast his voice all over the globe, and threatens to suspend all energy in the Earth's atmosphere and turn day into night, unless the world immediately destroys all arms and vehicles of warfare. U.S. Secret Service agent Jack Deering is sent to Arizona to investigate, where he meets the scientist's daughter, Jean. The 10-episode battle then ensues between Deering, a spy for the Russian government, an agent from Scotland Yard, and a mysterious cloaked man from nowhere, who pursue each other from Canada to California in an attempt to acquire the secret of the air, unquote. Unfortunately, I don't have much information about this serial to discuss, but after watching the first episode recreation, from the Serial Squadron's YouTube channel, I can't wait for the rest of the episodes to be released. But it's been a few years, so I'm not holding my breath. The first episode was pretty cool to listen to, and the story description sounds like a sci-fi film from the 1950s, which intrigues me all the more. One of the many lost projects that makes me want to build a time machine so we can travel back to the early 20th century and watch all of these hidden gems. When listing all the subgenres within science fiction film, the musical comedy sci-fi probably isn't too high on many people's list. It didn't take long after talkies took over Hollywood for films to add song and dance. In 1930, director David Butler and the Fox Film Corporation thought it was a good idea to combine futuristic societies, comedy, and singing. Just Imagine features the vaudeville star turned film actor L. Brendel, along with Maureen O'Sullivan, John Garrick, and Marjorie White. Set in the futuristic world of 1980, which looks way too much like 1930, but with people flying small airplanes instead of driving cars. The film whimsically envisions a utopian society where technological advancements abound. The film focuses on the story of J-21, played by John Garrick. The film combines futuristic elements with musical numbers and slapstick comedy. 
We follow J21's journey as he navigates his imagined future, including flying cars, automated food dispensers, peculiar societal norms, and a bizarre trip to Mars. When a man from 1930, played by Al Brandel, is revived in 1980, he serves as our fish out of water, getting to know this future world. He's the one that says what the audience is thinking. Marina Sullivan is our leading lady. She would go on to play Jane in Tarzan the Ape Man in 1932. But there's little for her to do here, except for wait for the leading man to get back from Mars. In this world, people are simply numbers without names. Food comes in pill form, and babies are purchased from vending machines. Earth is visually futuristic, and Mars is a jungle. Despite the film's lighthearted tone and inventive set design, it reflects the era's fascination with technological progress and offers a unique blend of science fiction and musical entertainment. Influenced by Metropolis, especially in its set design, the costume design, on the other hand, from Alice O'Neill, Sophie Wachner, and Dolly Tree, doesn't help the futuristic atmosphere as much as costumes should, and feels like the 1930s, but oddly only from the Earth characters. The costumes for the Martian characters, on the other hand, are much more intricate and imaginative. Set design by Stephen Gasson and Ralph Hammerus, with miniature work by Marcel Degato and Willis O'Brien. O'Brien was best known for his work on The Lost World from 1925, and would go on to work on King Kong in 1933 and Mighty Joe Young in 1949. Over 50 visual effects shots were accomplished using the Dunning process by loading two reels into a camera so they pass through the camera gate together, an innovative approach at the time. The songs for the film were written by Buddy G. De Silva, Lou Brown, and Ray Henderson. They also wrote the screenplay for the film. And it would have been a lot better with actual writing professionals. They also produced the film, too, so they hired the best writers they could find for the job. The New York Times called the film clever and highly imaginative, and most praised the set design. The New York Times critic would go on to call the film a one-time-only novelty stunt to highlight vaudeville star Elle Brendel. And Wonder Stories magazine wrote in their February 1931 issue that they recommended the film because it, quote, showed off the wonders our science fiction authors have been writing about. Nominated for the Academy Award for Best Art Direction, Just Imagine became notable for being the first sci-fi film to be nominated for an Oscar. With a budget of $1.1 million, including $170,000 alone for just one giant miniature, the film was a box office flop, but did make some of its money back by selling parts of the sets and props to other futuristic productions, such as Flash Gordon and Buck Rogers. This was not the last sci-fi musical we'll see in the 1930s. I'll cover It's Great to Be Alive in my upcoming video about the films of 1933. I know this film isn't high on many people's list of favorite films, but I enjoyed some of the portions that took place on Earth, but I found most of the Martian part of the story to drag on and felt like a completely different film. Like many reviews from the time, the best parts of the film are in the production and set design. My favorite character was Betsy, but she's only a supporting character. The other characters were quite dull, especially the women who are treated like second-class citizens in this alleged future society. In the end, it's just an odd film and a mix of several genres that just doesn't work. Because of the financial loss of Just Imagine and Things to Come in 1936, along with the Great Depression and mainstream interest in any genre but sci-fi, Hollywood wouldn't take a chance on big-budget sci-fi films until the early 1950s. With the exception of a few serials in the 1930s, such as Flash Gordon, and even that only had a budget of $350,000. Many filmmakers working in the late 20s to early 30s in Europe and America were trying their hand at sci-fi, but between the flops at the time like Metropolis, High Treason, and now Just Imagine, 
it wasn't a profitable genre worth taking a chance on, at least in the producer's and studio's minds. Even staples like Dr. Jekyll and Frankenstein, that were once considered science fiction by the standards at the time, were about to be taken over by Universal Studios to head up their emerging popular horror genre, starting with Frankenstein in 1931. The beginning of the decade saw the publication of several captivating science fiction novels and pulp magazine short stories that focused on technological advancements and societal shifts. Beyond shaping the genre, some of these would go on to inspire future filmmakers and storytellers, either as direct adaptations or as the seeds for future sci-fi adventures. Last and First Men by Olaf Stapledon this visionary future history novel chronicles the evolution of 18 distinct human species on Earth. It explores the philosophical, sociological, and existential themes that would go on to influence Arthur C. Clarke, H.P. Lovecraft, C.S. Lewis, among many others. Icelandic composer Johan Johansson made his 2020 posthumous feature film directorial debut with a multimedia adaptation of the novel that was narrated by actress Tilda Swinton. Utopolis, by German author Werner Illing, is a novel about the perils of capitalism in a utopian world. When a highly advanced civilization is about to be conquered by the last capitalist, two strangers are tasked with saving their society. Though not directly adapted into a feature film, the novel did anticipate several future technologies including magnetic levitating trains, animated hologram drones, autonomous cars, as well as taking some scathing shots at future Fuhrer Adolf Hitler. The creation of the American magazine Astounding Stories of Super Science showed the growing interest in sci-fi pulp magazines. It would later go on to be renamed Analog Science Fiction and Fact. Some notable contributions include the publication of the first installment of Isaac Asimov's Foundation series, as well as A.E. Van Voigt's Slan serialization, not to mention stories from Robert A. Heinlein, L. Ron Hubbard, and C.L. Moore. There were several notable sci-fi writers born in 1930. Marion Zimmer Bradley, born June 3rd. Though best known for her genre-blending Dark Over series and the fantasy feminist-themed The Mist of Avalon, she is celebrated for her contributions to science fiction and fantasy literature, often exploring complex interpersonal relationships, social dynamics, and gender roles within richly imagined speculative worlds. J.G. Ballard, born November 15th. Ballard wrote in various genres from satire to experimentation of the new wave science fiction movement and post-apocalyptic novels like The Drowned World, as well as High Rise. He scrutinized the psychological and social ramifications of technological excess, urban decay, and the breakdown of societal norms. Many of his works have been adapted into radio plays, feature films, or television series including his war novel, Empire of the Sun, as well as Crash, not the best picture winner, High Rise, and The Drowned World. History, culture, the sciences, and the arts were rapidly changing in the early 1930s. Science fiction is never created in a vacuum. Writers and filmmakers are influenced by the events of their time to create future works that, when done right, can be timeless. To understand the sci-fi films of 1930 fully, we must take a brief glance at the societal events influencing the collective human experience. And so, for the rest of this episode, I will focus on the world at large that played a role in influencing future filmmakers and storytellers. The Discovery of Pluto On February 18th, astronomer Clyde Tombaugh discovered Pluto, which would be classified as the ninth planet in our solar system until it was demoted to a dwarf planet in 2006. Gandhi Salt March In March of 1930, Mahatma Gandhi 
led the salt march in India as a nonviolent protest against the British monopoly on salt production, becoming a pivotal moment in the Indian independence movement. The London Naval Conference In April, the London Naval Conference of 1930 aimed to address naval disarmament and prevent an arms race among major powers, particularly in the aftermath of World War I. The Collapse of the Bank of the United States In December, the Bank of the United States, one of the largest banks in the country at the time, collapsed, contributing to the severity of the ongoing Great Depression, the first showing of Grant Wood's American Gothic. This iconic painting, American Gothic, was unveiled at the Art Institute of Chicago, becoming one of the most recognizable images in American art that is still memed and reproduced to this day. In 1930, filmmaking entered a transformative era marked by the full integration of synchronized sound technology. The transition from silent films to talkies continued, with studios investing heavily in sound equipment and training their personnel to adapt to this new cinematic presentation. Major studios such as MGM, Paramount, and Warner Brothers maintained their dominance through the studio system, controlling various aspects of film production distribution, and exhibition. Despite economic challenges brought about by the Great Depression, Hollywood continued to produce a diverse range of films exploring new genres, storytelling techniques, and the early possibilities of color cinematography. This was the year that The Hollywood Reporter was first published by William R. Wilkerson. He wanted to provide timely and comprehensive coverage of the industry and became a pioneering trade that would shape business practices in Hollywood. On March 31, 1930, the Motion Picture Production Code was created but largely ignored until 1934. Better known as the Hayes Code, it would eventually impose moral standards on Hollywood films. This greatly affected how stories were told on screen for the next few decades, and greatly affected how films were written, filmed, and produced, binding creative pursuits to arbitrary rules. Science fiction films were not the most popular genre at the time. Most studios around the world relied on melodrama and musicals. To get a true sense of where the sci-fi genre stood in 1930, it's important to look at the popular and influential films of the year. Though this channel is primarily about science fiction, I'd like to zoom out a bit and look at the non-sci-fi films that were popular this year. Whoopi, a musical comedy starring Eddie Cantor, featured the exuberance of the Jazz Age and was the highest grossing film of the year, making $2.6 million on a $1.3 million budget. This year also saw the big screen debuts of Humphrey Bogart and Spencer Tracy working together in Up the River. There were the debuts of James Cagney and Bing Crosby. Hedy Lamar started as an extra Laurence Olivier was making waves in England, and John Wayne starred in his first leading role. And here are some of the other popular and influential non-sci-fi films of 1930. All Quiet on the Western Front This powerful anti-war drama directed by Louis Milestone depicted the harrowing experiences of a group of German soldiers during World War I, as they confront the brutal realities of modern warfare, it would go on to win the Academy Award for Best Picture. The Blue Angel Directed by Joseph von Sternberg, this German musical follows a once-respected professor who becomes infatuated with a cabaret singer. Exploring themes of desire, societal norms, and obsession, it is best known today as the international debut of Marlena Dietrich. Animal Crackers is a Marx Brothers comedy that tells the story of a weekend at a society party where chaos ensues in typical Marx Brothers satirical and quick-witted fashion. The Divorcee is a pre-code drama and explores the consequences of infidelity and societal expectations after a woman seeks revenge for her husband's unfaithfulness by embracing a liberated lifestyle. Hell's Angels is the epic film from businessman, investor, pilot, and director Howard Hughes. It follows the epic lives of two brothers and a friend who navigate love, rivalry, and the skies. It featured groundbreaking aerial combat scenes, but it is best known today for its difficult behind-the-scenes production. 
Anna Christie, directed by Clarence Brown, this film featured Greta Garbo in her first talkie. It explores the complexities of redemption and love, and also reconnects with her father. The science fiction films of 1930, Just Imagine, The Voice from the Sky, and Alrani collectively embody the dynamic and evolving nature of the genre during this period, though none of them are particularly remembered today. Just Imagine wanted to showcase the era's fascination with technological progress and the promise of a streamlined future through comedy and song, though never really reached its potential. The Voice in the Sky utilized radio broadcasting as a narrative device, reflecting the technological advancements of the time and hinting at the profound influence of mass communication on society. And lastly, Alrani delves into the ethical and moral dilemmas of artificial insemination, reflecting societal anxieties and wanting to push the boundaries of science fiction storytelling. Collectively, they served as cultural artifacts reflecting the societal hopes, fears, and technological innovations that characterize this decade. Thank you so much for watching. Please remember to like, comment, and subscribe for future videos about the history of sci-fi cinema.